Good afternoon from Germany. My name is Mohamed Marwan, a cardiology consultant at the University Hospital Erlangen, and I'm very happy to join you in this seminar on update cardiac imaging and the role of CT angiography in the TAVI procedure. These are my disclosures. So the spectrum of cardiac CT has changed a lot over the last years, especially the last 10 years. We moved a little bit further from just looking at the CT or the coronary arteries towards using diagnostic information out of the CT that can really depict anatomy into in, in, in very precise way because of the high spatial and temporary resolution and the quality of the volumetric information. So we're using more and more those diagnostic information out of the CT to plan different kinds of structural heart interventions. So we're not only looking at coronaries, but moving towards different cardiac structures that the valve chambers, the pericardium, and using this in everyday routine for planning um, structural heart disease intervention, especially with the advancements uh, in, the, um, in the technology of, um, of structural interventions. And if you look over 40 years ago, it took 17, seven minutes to get one image of the brain um, um, back then. And with the improvement of the um, CT technology with the modern CT systems with about 300 slices of the heart acquired simultaneously within few seconds with a very high spatial and temporary resolution. We get very high quality um, um, CT data sets and actually if needed with special acquisition forms we can also get functional information as you can see here in this case with mitral valve endocarditis. Of course primarily looking at function and echo and um, MR but still CT can be used if, um, uh, if adequately acquired to look also on function. And within the context of the TAVI or TAVR, depending on where you come from, um, the use of CT is actually an established modality that is very crucial for the procedural planning and the procedural outcome. To look at the aortic roots, anatomy, dimensions, size the annulus, and look at the neighboring coronaries if there are not any issues with potential obstruction of the of the ostia of the coronaries and of course to look at the access information we, we have a lot of information to cover in a short time and that where CT actually fits quite well because of the rapidness of acquisition with the modern, modern CT technology uh, to decide whether a transfemoral or non-transfemoral access should be performed or could be performed. And with more and more technology, we're getting more and more data and more and more information about the use of seat or the use of TAVI in different patient cohorts, starting with the high-risk cohort where we started with the TAVI. Um, and you can see here meta-analysis looking on all cause mortalities on heart endpoint in different patient cohorts. High risk, of course, favors TAVI. We know that and even with less risk patients, whether intermediate risk or low risk patients, you can see that the all cause mortality in this analysis here favors TAVI. So this as we're moving towards the healthier or less sick patients, puts even more weight on the CT as the screening modality or the planning modality to filter out patients um, that are potentially not very suitable for TAVI because of anatomy, because of calcium, whatever the high risk criteria is, and those patients should be sent for or should be discussed for a different treatment modality, which should be uh, which would be surgery in this case. So especially in less sick patients, lower lower risk patients. CT has more even responsibility to get this kind of, of information. I will try to put it in a clinical for the rest of the, um, of the presentation, a, the clinical way how we look at scans or how we read scans for TAVI in our department. So we start by reading the analyst, looking at the aortic root, and then looking at the coronaries in the sense of the relationship between the analyst plane and the neighboring coronaries not by looking at stenosis, which we sometimes do for TAVI patients, but usually those patients needs, um, need high, um, need um, um, invasive angiography, coronary angiography, to predict the implantation angle out of the CT data set that can be used later on during fluoroscopy and implantation, have a look at access information and decide whether a transfemoral access is possible, yes or no, and look at extracardiac findings and report the relevant ones. So if we, we start by looking at the analysis, I think we as cardiologists have learned quite a lot after uh, getting into the TAVI procedure and the CT for TAVI. So we've learned a lot about the aortic analysis after uh, because of the details that we've, we've got into in order to adequately report different kinds of dimensions and different kinds of anatomic information for the procedure. And uh, if you look at the images here, and maybe you've seen this uh, diagram before, so the aortic analysis plane is not a structure that you will see in CT. 
it's a, a virtual plane that connects the cusps and surgical points. So if we look at this image here in the middle, the red structures are the cusps, and the lowermost points of the cusp, the three cusps here, are connected by the green circle here, which is the virtual plane of the annulus. You can see it here, and also in this 3D reconstruction. So these are the sinuses, and the lowermost points of the three sinuses is the annulus plane that should be adjusted in CT. How to do that? There are different ways of doing that. We here use a very systematic, a very simple, and just by using the normal um, CT software that comes with any machine, we pragmatically start by looking at one cusp insertion point. So typically the right cusp insertion point, you can see the right leaflet where it connects to the LVOT. And the crosshairs here, we fix the lines at this point, look for the non-cusp insertion point, which is usually at the inter atrial septum. You can see here, this is the septum. And this is, would be the non corneal cusp insertion point. And look for the third, which is the left cusp insertion point. And with this systematic way, you've adjusted the plane of the analyst, which, as said, is a plane that connects the three cusp insertion points all together in one plane. Of course, we have now different kinds of software that would allow you to or help you to get to this plane with some input from the reader. This is one example of the software that is available on market with some also that um, compares the expert measurements with the software with very good scientific results. But we have to be just careful in patients with hampered image quality. There's anyways need for input from the reader to carefully determine cusp insertion point, manual or semi-automatic um, detection. So we need your input in order to get the right analyst plane, which is very decisive for the um, success of the procedure. We have to be aware that not uncommonly those patients have some kind of rhythm issues. So this is one patient with atrial fibrillation. And you can see this is the example without any kind of ECG editing. You can see it's, a, it's double contours here around the analyst. So the analyst plane here is simply, you cannot size in this image quality because you have no clear idea where does the analyst start or where does the analyst end. So you have to use your um, um, expertise and try to get better image quality out of this um, um, information you can see here, you can edit the ECG and in the exact same patient with retrospective ECG get, uh, um, gating or prospective gating with wide image or wide um, window, which allows you to change the time point where you get the images a little bit. And in this case, you can get very nice image, images as you can see here and get very precise details of the analysis and then start measurement. So with, the, with that, we have the first checklist for the analyst. The right plane is very important. So take some time to get to this plane and make sure you're at the right plane. Image quality is decisive and ECG trigger is important. And in case of artifacts, in case of rhythm issues, you have to check for ECG for possibility of reconstruction. Beyond, um, so after we have adjusted the look at the analyst plane, we have to mathematically size this analyst to decide on the procedure that should be implanted. So usually or not uncommonly, it's an oval structure that turns into a circular structure after implantation, unless the anatomy was extremely calcified. So how to size this oval structure to, de to decide on a structure or on a procedure that will be circular at the end of the day? Some mathematical issues here, in, but basically there are three different ways of measurement of the analyst. The mean diameter, which means you measure one dimension, the short dimension, the long dimension, and get the mean diameter out of both, and assume that the mean diameter of this native analyst will remain the same after implantation, and use this mean diameter to predict the prosthesis. So the, the new prosthesis should have this mean diameter, so to, so to say. The other two ways are circumference and area measurements. So you trace the analyst, as you can see in those two images, and get either the area or the circumference to the length of the analyst and use this information to predict the procedure that will be implanted. So the circumference should be the same before and after and use this information, which is which is which makes more sense because the length of the native analyst would not change. And with the area, you assume that the area of this oval structure would be the same after implantation. So you use this area as the area to be for the prosthesis which is not entirely mathematically correct because the area of this oval structure is not the same as the circular structure, but because of certain issues and technical um, considerations as, re as regards measurements of circumference. So if you look here, the tracing of the analyst, there are so-called 
um, um, smoothening algorithms or correction algorithms for measuring circumference in CT. And depending on how much of anatomic information you get into or you take into consideration whether you go into straight lines or go into every single teeny weeny detail. So circumference measures, measurements usually change or a certain kind of variability between different observers and if one observer repeated that a couple of times. So are a little bit interchangeable and with that or for that area measurements are commonly used for, for, um, for, for different kinds of, um, of prosthesis on mark. So the, these are the three different ways of sizing the annulus. But beyond looking at the size and the numbers and quantification, there are lots and lots of anatomic information that are important to be uh, considered or to be reported. Calcium is, as it is our enemy for the cardiac CT chronic angiography because it prevents from us from looking at the lumen of the arteries in a good way. It's also the enemy within the TAVI, uh, TAVI procedure. Um, you can see here a patient with excessive calcium around the commissures, but not only the commissures extending into the LVUT, as you can see down here, down here in this image as well, and the 3D reconstruction is also very impressive as much as the amount of calcium is concerned. And the procedure goes inside, unfortunately we have to resuscitate, and after the first injection you can see here in the orthography some leak of the contrast outside, which is a clear case of annulus rupture in CT. You can see the contrast coming out here. So these patients have very bad prognosis. We could at least um, solve the acute problem. Common, as in this patient, we lost her on intensive um, um, care later on. So these patients are um, as far as current. And the other spectrum of calcium, which is not only injury of the aortic root, is the paravalvular regurgitation, which is something that has been clearly shown to be associated with a poor outcome. So this is patient with, even, with not very much calcium as the last patient, but you can see here two calcium nodules in the analyst, but not only the plane of the analyst, they extend downwards into the LVT, like two calcium tubes here. And if you can imagine if a prosthesis sits here on this wall, it's difficult that it would cover this area here and potentially could cause aortic regurgitation, especially for Balloon uh, for self-expandable prosthesis, which with less radial trap, and you can see here a lot of aortic regurgitation, relevant aortic regurgitation after implantation in this patient. And another patient of calcium where everything goes fine. So this is here also a lot of calcium, but everything goes fine. Uh, this is a case we had a couple of years ago. So calcium is difficult, and sometimes it's difficult to predict what will happen in those patients. And um, that's why I think those are the most difficult patients that have that, that need to be discussed within the team. Um, in a multidisciplinary way, we have to reconsider the operability of the patient, and then certain kinds of decisions should be taken, type of the device, size of the device, and borderline anatomy is technique of implantation. These are things that are very important for the procedure. So moving on from the analyst towards the coronaries, as we mentioned earlier, we look at the relationship between the takeoff of the coronaries to the plane of the analyst, which is where the prosthesis is anchored. Um, and compared to surgical procedures where the leaflets, the native leaflets, those leaflets here are excised during the surgery, entirely those leaflets will be pushed into the walls or um, um, away. And they have to land somewhere, so they have to be accommodated somewhere. And in some cases, those leaflets could lead to obstruction of the osteo of the coronaries. So we can see here a case of lots of calcium here on the leaflet. The distance between the takeoff of the left vein in this case and the annulus plane is not visually not very small, which is one marker that has been repeatedly or is repeatedly being reported as the um, risk or predicting factor for left vein or for um, coronary obstruction. And you can see here after putting the valve, there's a clear compromise of the left vein here at the ostium, and you can see the calcium here sort of lands into the left vein and compromises the ostium. Another example with very short distances, one factor that has been shown to be uh, or commonly only, as be only used as the factor for um, obstruction risk, and you can see a very short distance, nine millimeter, but in this case, a very wide sinus or wide aortic root, and this makes um, 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 uh, things much better, and you can see clearly in this case, everything went fine. You can see the wide sinus is here, so this is no problem. So a very short distance per se is not, the issue for coronary obstruction if you have wide sinuses, so you have enough space for the leaflets to land. So it's not only the distance, there's lots of things that have to be looked, and you have 
looked upon and you have to look at the anatomy altogether. If you have big chunks of calcium in the leaflets, if you have a ladder root, so there are other considerations that might change the decision whether coronary obstruction is potentially possible, yes or no. As we earlier said, the implantation angle that we use or that we, we need to take or need to have in, during implantation, especially for balloon expandable prosthesis, you want to look orthogonally on the valve, and not, but not only orthogonally, it's nice to have the right cusp in the middle so you can see the pigtail is sitting in the right cusp and the left and non-coronary cusp on the right and left hand sides. So this plane here could be adjusted in CT. So we have the CT data set. Um, any direction you're looking on, the valve after you've adjusted the analysis is orthogonal, but you want to look on the right cusp perpendicularly. So this would be looking onto, the, onto this plane, which is shown up here. So the angles are shown up here, and you can give this angle to the cath lab and use that during the implantation, which saves some time and saves some orthography. And with that, you save some contrast. And um, of course, we look at not only on the aortic root and the heart, which is sort of the first step and a very decisive step, but we look, of course, onto the axis information, whether the vessels are big enough as far as the lumen is concerned, are they tortuous or very much tortuous that we should be concerned, or calcification. So these are the main three things we look upon. So as far as lumen is concerned, it's quite clear we need to know if the vessels are big enough that they could accommodate the interventional material. So with that, as we know, we just need to have a good cross-section. So looking at perpendicular cross-section, orthogonal cross-sections on the vessel in order not to overestimate the size and then look at the min minimal luminal band. Torsuosities are common in those patients. As you can see in this lady here with multiple bends, but with a stiff wire, with a long sheath, those get stretched um, out and it's not a problem um, if they're not calcified. Now, the issue is if you have torsuality in presence of calcification, as you look here in those vessels, which look quite big, and I'll show you in a second another image for this patient, torsuality is very extreme on the right side and even more extreme on the left side. If you look at the um, um, grayscale images here, the lumen is not the issue, it's big enough, but you can see those white lines. So this is just calcium causing the tube, uh, causing the vessels um, down from the puncture side up there. So this is a very important thing that you have to be careful when reporting on peripheries, especially that calcium could be look a little bit hazy or not be easily um, um, seen, or the vessels are quite big as far as the lumen is concerned, which sort of falsely gives you the, um, the feeling that they are big enough. And I will show you this just uh, um, um, just trying to get an invasive angiography in this patient from a pyramidal root with a long sheath with a stiff wire and was a catastrophe. So there's no way you can get um, TAVI from a femoral axis here. You can see the vessels could be seen here in fluoroscopy. So this is, these are basically calcium tubes. And we ended up doing this lady through a transaortic root. So these were the main things uh, when looking at the re at reporting TAVI. Of course, we have a whole body CT, lots of extra cardiac structures that should be looked upon our radiolog radiologists are not very happy. It's a, a big number of whole body CTs, but we do report extra cardiac, at least relevant findings. Might change the decision. And this is how our report looks like. It's a very simple one page report usually, where we give the Agatston score, we report the analyst dimensions, the mean diameter, the area, the perimeter. We give the angle in a sort of a small table, as you can see here, LAO, REO, called the cranial. We report the coronary distance in numbers, but not only numbers, because distance alone is not the entire issue, but the risk of obstruction descriptively and whether yes or no. We report the axis, the minimum lumen diameter, if there are any calcifications, circular calcifications, and the extracardic findings, and end up here with a conclusion with the area and perimeter, two dimensions commonly used for different vendors for the sizing, transfemoral, if possible, yes or no. And sometimes you have to, you have to prefer one side on the other, and this we also write on the report here. And with that, I would like to conclude. So CT for TAPI is essential for procedural planning, for a better procedural outcome, and hence a patient outcome. Image quality is decisive, and this has to be worked upon because this translates into better um, reporting, which means better procedural outcome. Analyst plane, spend some time on that, learn how to get to the analyst plane. If not happy, repeat that again. Coronary obstruction risk is multifactorial, not only the distances, but other parameters that flow into the decision whether obstruction risk is there or no. 
implantation ang angle, which is inflammation for free. And for the peripherals, just be aware of calcium, especially in the presence of Torschwalsteis or circular calcifications. These uh, might get quite unpleasant during intervention. With that, I thank you very much. And maybe later on, later on during discussion, if there are any questions within the chat, uh, I would be very happy to answer. Thank you very much and enjoy this um, um, seminar.